In the Mesozoic, the reptilian clade was diversifying to fill all kinds of ecological niches. The dinosaurs are perhaps the most famous, having dominated the land for hundreds of millions of years. But those ancient reptiles came to dominate other major biomes, like the ichthyosaurs in the sea and the pterosaurs in the sky. The news I bring you today concerns this latter clade of animals, the pterosaurs. These were a diverse group of reptiles that emerged in the late Triassic around 230 million years ago. As the first vertebrates to evolve the ability to fly, they were highly successful when competing with the dinosaurs, who were pretty much entirely bound to the surface. They evolved a unidirectional respiratory tract, a warm-blooded metabolism, and a kind of hair made of pycnofibers which may have acted like insulating or streamlining feathers. The pterosaurs survived up until the asteroid impact 66 million years ago, which led to their extinction. Now the pterosaurs are a really interesting clade. There is so much we don't understand about them. And over the decades, the ever-growing fossil record has answered many questions, but it's also created many more. For example, early pterosaur evolution is shrouded in mystery. The earliest definite pterosaurs were relatively small. They hunted insects and small vertebrates. We suspect they lived in trees as they were good climbers, and they had both tails and beaks lined with teeth. We don't know much at all about the ancestors to these early pterosaurs. But the later pterosaurs, those that came millions of years later, they underwent tremendous diversification, growing narrower wings, a longer neck and head, and a greatly reduced tail and fewer or zero teeth. Many species were small, but many others were enormous, such as the Quetzalcoatlus, one of the largest flying animals to ever live, with a wingspan of nine meters. Another mystery is how the pterosaurs aged and matured. Until recently, there hadn't been any discoveries of fossilized pterosaur eggs or embryos. This changed recently when some were discovered, and they showed evidence of having strong bones, adult-like proportions, and soft, membranous wing tissue having formed before hatching. All of this points to another mystery surrounding the pterosaurs. How did they learn to fly? Some paleontologists think they could fly pretty much immediately, but others argue that pterosaur youth had to learn how to fly over time, only achieving it about halfway through adolescence. Now this is a good point to transition to the research paper for today's news. This is an analytical study that was published in the journal Scientific Reports. The scientists examined a broad collection of hatchling pterosaur bones, including embryos and newly hatched young. This limits their data to only four species, but it leaves enough specimens to conduct viable research. Of these four, two of them are pretty small, and two of them are decently large. Not huge, but around a meter in length, with a slightly wider wingspan. So let's take a look at their abstract to get a brief synopsis of what's going on here. Quote, Competing views exist on the behavior and lifestyle of pterosaurs during the earliest phases of life. A flap-early model proposes that hatchlings were capable of independent life and flapping flight. A fly-late model posits that juveniles were not flight-capable until about 50% of adult size, and a glide-early model requires that young juveniles were flight-capable, but only able to glide. We test these models by quantifying the flight abilities of very young juvenile pterosaurs via analysis of wing bone strength, wing loading, wing span, and wing aspect ratios, primarily using data from embryonic and hatchling specimens from Pterodostro guinazui and Synopteris dungai." Unquote. As a result of their calculations, they were able to estimate the gliding and flying abilities of pterosaur hatchlings. If you refer to their paper, check out Figure 4. Figure 4 is pretty interesting, because it shows that the hatchling pterosaurs were likely far superior gliders than virtually any other gliding species alive today, like the giant flying squirrel Petarista petarista, the sugar glider Petarus breviceps, the black-bearded gliding lizard Draco melanopogon, and Wallace's flying frog Racophorus nigropalmatus, among many others. Now, the rest of the abstract concisely summarizes their findings. They say, quote, 
The Humeri of pterosaur juveniles are similar in bending strength to those of adults, and able to withstand launch and flight. Wing size and wing aspect ratios of young juveniles are also in keeping with powered flight. We therefore reject the fly late and glide early models. We further show that young juveniles were excellent gliders, albeit not reliant on specialist gliding. The wing forms of very young juveniles differ significantly from larger individuals, meaning that variation in speed, maneuverability, takeoff angle, and so on was present across a species as it matured. Juveniles appeared to have been adapted for flight in cluttered environments, in contrast to larger, older individuals. We propose, on the basis of these conclusions, that pterosaur species occupied distinct niches across ontogeny." Unquote. Wow, super fascinating stuff. Um, all right, it was a bit technical though. Uh, there's a lot of detail there. So to summarize what they found, all of the important findings and all the cool little details, they believed that the pterosaur hatchlings had strong enough bones, like they're humerus, to handle the muscular activity that was involved in flight. Flying is hard, you know, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of force. The muscles required to move the wings need to be pretty strong, and they need to have really good endurance to be able to keep beating, keep flapping, keep flying, keep holding this animal up against the force of gravity. They also found that the young pterosaurs were really good gliders, but the anatomy suggests that they were capable of actually flying, you know, powered flight. What this basically means is that they could glide, if they so wanted to, like many birds alive today, and they were really good gliders, perhaps because they were also pretty good flyers too, so they could like make little adjustments and stuff. But the different wing form in the juveniles that the researchers mentioned, uh, the different like flight strategies and uh, what they call a cluttered environment, that's really fascinating. Because that suggests that these pterosaur hatchlings were growing up in forested environments. So there's a lot of trees and branches and foliage and vines and who knows what else in the way. And so when they were younger and smaller, and they were in this cluttered environment, their higher maneuverability was a big advantage. Yeah, what did they say earlier? They say they mentioned uh, speed, maneuverability, takeoff angle. Yeah, all of this stuff was supreme in these smaller, more agile, younger pterosaurs. You now the scientists make the point that as the pterosaurs grow up and increase in size, their flight dynamics necessarily have to change, and this encourages them to leave the forests and take flight in the open sky. From this vantage point, the pterosaur hatchlings could have seen the world like no other vertebrate ever had before. Little did they know it, but they would be the only reptiles capable of powered flight in all of Earth's evolutionary history. Again, very fascinating stuff. We're building an understanding of these pterosaurs, these amazing ancient Mesozoic creatures, one resolved mystery at a time. <laughs>